It is now my pleasure to introduce Victoria Vrana. She is the deputy, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, she is the deputy director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation is of course a leader in worldwide health philanthropy and we're eager to hear her insights on how philanthropy as a sector can and is responding at this time. Victoria, I pass it to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Marsha, and thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for the invitation. I, um, like many of you, are, I'm spending enormous amounts of time with my family. I've got three kids here at home and about three times the normal interaction with my colleagues. And so that's lovely, but it's great to connect out with other people as well. I wish we were all in Miami. Um, but this is, is definitely better than nothing. So I'm, I'm impressed with how quickly you pivoted your event um, to, to this virtual experience. Um, just a second about the team I'm on, and I'm one of many deputy directors at the, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and I'm on a team called the Philanthropic Partnership Team. And our mission is to increase the quality and quantity of philanthropic giving by individuals from everyday donors to ultra high net worth donors. So we work directly with ultra high net worth donors. We invest in a lot of research and innovation for everyday donors. And we invest a lot in the infrastructure for philanthropy, things like associations, data, policy and regulatory issues. So we're the giving team at the foundation, which is um, we're, we're issue agnostic, which is a little rare. I'm gonna try and um, share my slides right now. Uh, they don't want to come up. Hang on just a second. Here we go. Let's see. How is that working? What if I... Yep. How's that? Good? Yeah. You're, okay. you're great. We can see it. Fantastic. So, um, COVID-19 is a global crisis of unprecedented scale, and it's unleashed an equally unprecedented philanthropic response. We've seen actions from $100 million grants from foundations and corporations to neighbors helping neighbors in extraordinary ways. Candid, um, the organization that was created when GuideStar and Foundation Center combined, has been closely tracking the global private philanthropic response through news stories and other publicly available resources. This is from Saturday, so it's probably out of date already. Um, but philanthropic funding announced in the last seven weeks has reached one $1.9 billion so far. That includes 269 grants from 225 funders to 63 recipients. Some of these things are pledges, so not all of the recipients are known. If you look at the causes, um, obviously infectious diseases, medical support, health, these are all the things at the top. Education is a close fifth, right? I think the needs of all of these children out of school are front and center for everyone and the equitable distribution of education resources is going to be critical. And um, there's another side to this story though about which parts of the sector are losing funds right now. And Andres, as he talked about the JCCs, the camps, the day schools, there, there are so many parts of our sector that will be weakened. And so it's important that we have the full picture and that we're watching the full picture. You can see the distribution of countries where the funds are coming from so far right here. Um, United States and China just a week ago were 84% of pledges and 97% of dollar value. That's now changed to 78% of pledges and 80% of dollar value, which is good. It means more countries are coming in. As, as China and the U.S., um, the amounts are rising, you also see involvement from many other funders. We don't yet know what the everyday giving response will be like, but I anticipate it'll also be record-breaking. I was talking to someone at PayPal this morning about the ways everyday donors are using PayPal and Venmo to just give to anybody. There are Google Docs where people are just collecting Venmo handles of people who need money and people are just giving money, um, which is amazing. Also a little bit of risk for fraud in there. So there's, there's some things to watch out for. Um, there have been 22,000 uh, fundraisers created on GoFundMe in the past several weeks, which have raised $40 million. And this is just, you know, $10, $20 donations. This is a significant response from around the world, but it's also not enough. 
So timely and dramatic actions are needed if the philanthropic sector is going to play the pivotal role that it must to complement governments and the private sector. When we look back at this time a year from now, and we will look back, and it's fun to imagine <laughs> looking back, what's the story the world will tell about philanthropy's response? Imagine seamless connections between all levels of giving, from grassroots givers to ultra high net worth philanthropists, where the crowd can surface the needs for large givers and large gifts can catalyze small gestures through matches and credits. Imagine feeling like we're all part of the solution instead of on opposite sides. Imagine an efficient way to find trusted and curated opportunities to give your time, talent, and treasure in your local geography or to an urgent issue. And Andres talked about this, right? Your network is already on this. You're creating a database of needs and responses. That's the fantastic. It's the kind of coordinated response we need right now. Imagine platforms, networks like yours, and movements connecting to create a system that's adaptable to local circumstances, but it's nationally and it's internationally aligned with greater efficiency for nonprofits, greater effectiveness than ever before. We have the potential to come out of this crisis stronger. If we're successful, the giving behavior and the systems changes we enable now could transform our sector. And Andres talked about this as well. There is an opportunity here and you see it happening right now. I'll share a little bit with you about the Gates um, response. And I think you'll get these slides later. So don't feel like you have to look closely at this. Um, we're seeing amazing kind of unprecedented collaboration. Our programmatic response, as you can imagine, is evolving rapidly. And what I'm sharing now is probably the beginning of what we'll be doing. We began with health, um, and our COVID-19 mission consists of three components. We're working to rapidly accelerate detection and containment. So that involves testing. We're working to protect the most vulnerable, and the Gates is global. So when we think about most vulnerable, we think about the populations in Africa and South Asia. The numbers, the projections we're hearing for India in particular are heartbreaking and it's starting to hit in India and Africa. The third area of focus is to develop vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics for a sustained response. We're also, like all of you, concerned with the health and the safety of our staff and our grantees and our partners. The foundation so far has committed 105 million to date. 60 million of that is focused on R&D for drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. We announced a $125 million therapeutics accelerator, which is continuing to get um, uh, contributions. And that, so far, the core funders are the, are the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, and MasterCard. And, and this therapeutics accelerator will work to get the most promising therapeutics through clinical trial and manufacturing process quickly. Speed is critical here. $40 million of our funds are focused on surveillance, modeling, and health systems in Africa and South Asia. We're very concerned that cases of coronavirus in these areas will overwhelm the health facilities. That while deaths from corona could be high, deaths from non-related issues could be even higher. Pneumonia, malaria, complicated births can devastate communities. Gates Philanthropy Partners, the last thing on this list here, is the foundation's public charity. This is a, a, a little promoted vehicle that anyone can give to and give alongside the Gates Foundation. We've rapidly established a COVID-19 fund that can co-fund this work alongside the foundation. And I think it's taking gifts online now. They, it started receiving gifts as the website was being tested, which was a little alarming to the, to the web folks who want it all, all perfect. Um, I mentioned grantees, and Andres talked about this beautifully already, so I'll just touch on it lightly. But we're hearing from our individual grantees. We have about 15,000 um, grantees around the world, um, how concerned people are about what's happening in this moment. Nonprofits are incredibly worried about lost revenue from events and from online fundraising events. Um, sometimes these worries are exacerbated by funders and sponsors who aren't letting organizations transfer support to virtual events. Other organizations are really wrestling with previous grant agreements where they're trying to make milestones or hit, you know, specific results that don't make any sense right now. The immediate steps you can take to help your grantees reach out. 
even if you don't know what you're doing, you don't have your procedures in place, let your grantees know. As Andres told the story of the executive director getting the email, it makes all the difference in the world. Call people if you can. The human connection is really important. Accelerate and simplify grants and process. I changed five grants last week from project grants to gen op support and made them happen immediately. It felt so good and my grantees were so relieved and it saved us all a lot of time. Um, uh, pivot aggressively to meet the moment. So we're all going to have to shift what we're doing, including nonprofits. Organizations need support to think differently right now. They need to innovate. They need to brainstorm. They need to develop new strategies. Let them know you'll be flexible and that you'll help them do that. One of the last pieces is about supporting the nonprofit infrastructure. So networks like yours, um, associations of nonprofits, we need our coordinators now more than ever. So all of this great energy is not duplicative. So we don't have gaps out there in the sector. The, the connectors, the networks, the associations, the infrastructure, this part of the sector is traditionally starved. And when people are concerned with the front lines, they may neglect the infrastructure. Don't neglect the infrastructure. The last thing is about rethinking timeframes and priorities. Things are gonna take much longer and maybe have to go on pause. Other things need to happen yesterday. We all have to shift in our timeframes. Um, and you know, the, the last thing I'll mention is uh, pledges. Again, changing grant making behavior. There are a number of pledges out there. Here's one that was started by the Ford Foundation last week. I believe I saw one started by 19 different Jewish funders. Um, it's something to look out for. I see some nodding. I mean, I think that, that if we can come together and signal to grantees that we're committed to changing practices, um, it's a welcome leadership voice from our sector. So think about whatever you can do in your own role in your institution. It's time to step up and lead from wherever you're sitting. Thank you so much for what all of you are doing. As difficult as this is, I feel so personally lucky to work in the giving space right now. It's so encouraging to see how quickly people are moving to try and get help where it's needed. Just listening to you all this morning makes me feel even better and it really gives me hope for the future. So thank you for everything you're doing now and in the coming time. Back over to the next speaker or moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, this was uh, amazing to see the, the work of people like you and the Gates Foundation. And um, I'm happy that you can stay with us to uh, in here and participate in our Sort of internal communal conversation um, and we have now uh, we're joined by two great professionals in the Jewish community one is my dear friend Jeff Solomon who is rightfully called the Dean of the philanthropic uh, profession in the Jewish community uh, we all know him former head of ACBP the Andrew and Charles Roman philanthropies and a leader in his own right um, uh, and Mark Baker, who's the CEO of the uh, Combined Jewish Philanthropies, the Jewish Federation on Boston, one of the most thoughtful federation leaders uh, in the in the country. And um, I I wanted to start asking Jeff. Um, you know, in your long career, you've seen many uh, many crises and many upheavals from 9-11 to war in Gaza to the recession in the 90s. What are some lessons that you learned uh, on how the philanthropic community and how the community responds and should respond to this crisis? Thanks, Andres. And, and I have only um, a wonderful reaction to both your and Victoria's comments. Um, really meaningful and, and important. Um, I think the, the moment we're in was actually uh, captured by Martin Luther King in the last speech he gave in Memphis, which is, and I'm quoting, the nation is sick, trouble is in the land, confusion all around. But I know somehow that when it's dark enough, can you see the stars? 
And at the beginning of a crisis, and in many ways we are very much at the beginning, it's, it's hard to see the other side. Um, and yet, <clears throat> when one looks at the history of philanthropy's response to crises, and several examples come to mind. One that I wasn't around for, um, I, I miss this one, was right after the Revolutionary War in the United States. <laughs> and um, there was a crisis among the Jewish veterans as they grew older. And a group of women did what was one of the first, if you will, communal campaigns to take care of those women, th those, those veterans. And in 1823, when the last veteran died, um, they had $300 left over. And they decided <coughs> to start a childcare organization. And today's Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services with a budget in excess of $250 million is the result after 23 mergers of that decision of what to do with $300. And <coughs> in many ways that, that's relevant because things will change in our field. Um, every one of the crises whether the depression and the, the creation of the vocational service network within the field, tuberculosis and the creation of rehabilitation workshops, the um, Reagan election, which had the human services uh, people in the same kind of crisis mode that we are today, um, the opening of the former Soviet Union, the revolution in Ethiopia, 1990, 2000, 2008, and, and the various financial issues, Madoff, September 11th, the Intifada, each one of those represented opportunity. And it's hard to, it's hard to put those words out there because I'm, I'm in the middle of reading a wonderful book by Doris Kearns Goodwin on leadership in the age of turmoil. And she makes it clear that without empathy and a plan, you're not, you're not able to lead in moments of, of crisis. But I, within that context, there are going to be opportunities for us to re-engineer our community. And we need to not run away from those opportunities. Um, crisis is a catalyst. And um, in many ways, the other common theme that I have seen in, historically is, is um, the analogy to the Kubler-Ross five stages. Um, we are still in denial, um, but we need to ultimately move past those stages and really um, generate energy for a better community ahead while dealing compassionately and with empathy uh, with the people most affected at this moment in time. Thank you, Jeff. And, and uh, Mark, you're, you're in the hot seat in a way because in the next uh, weeks and months, you're gonna be need to make some very hard choices at the Federation level. Like it is a little bit playing God in a way, like who are you gonna fund, who are you gonna defund, how are you gonna, you know, uh, manage the competition among among different priorities, and and I'm wondering, where are you going to take the the wisdom and the the ethical compass? I would say, to um, to uh, to guide you in these decisions. Uh, thanks for that question, and thanks to everyone on this panel and Andres and Victoria for your opening and inspiring words. I think one of my answers is trying to sit on panels with people like Jeff Solomon. Um, and I, I mean that in all seriousness, Andres, you, you opened with the concept of humility and I, I can't resist responding to your phrase playing God because I think one of the deep risks right now, both ethical and spiritual, any time um, those of us who have power and decision-making, um, uh, so to speak, authority uh, by virtue of either positional authority or having resources, um, is to forget that we're doing all of this in service of something higher than ourselves. So uh, I think I will try to meditate every day 
on that um, and to, to remember the humility that you called for in your opening um, speech, especially in a, an organization like a federation where I try to remind myself and everyone around us every single day, we're doing the work we do with our community's resources in service of our community in many ways. Um, that, that's, that's what we do. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, kind of mining Jewish wisdom and Jewish tradition for, for what we can learn in this moment and, and what we can take from it in terms of leadership. And just two thoughts to, to open with. Um, the first is I love that you asked Jeff for a historical perspective, because I think it's just so Jewish to start by looking backwards. Even in an unprecedented moment, we need to remember that um, we are the inheritors um, of the wisdom and the experiences, oftentimes challenging ones for, of those who came before us, and that we do stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and to kind of hold that classic Jewish tension between looking backwards and knowing that we're going to need chidush, kind of innovation, new insights, we're going to have to somehow discover, uncover, create um, new solutions to new problems. Um, how can we become historians in this moment, not, uh, not because we think that the past has the answers, but because we know that if we're voracious about learning from it and unpacking it, we can take from it what hasn't worked, what has worked, and kind of incorporate that into new insights for the future. So that, that to me feels like a deeply, um, kind of a, a, a deep Jewish practice. Um, and the second I've been thinking about is um, the relationship between um, halakha and agada between Jewish law and let's call it um, narrative or um, the, and, and we see this in the Talmud all over the place. We see kind of almost rigid analytical legal arguments about how to navigate through competing values and how to navigate the complexity of the world. Um, and then right at the end of one, you will see a story that profoundly humanizes the conversation that just happened. And I think we've all been in this already. We're seeing, we're in moments where we're trying to come up with policy and strategy and systems. And we have to be like rigorously analytical about how to address this at every single dollar we spend. And then sometimes we realize, wait a minute, what about the, the human beings? And then we're in other conversations where it's like, we've got we to gotta save every single job, every single person and remember the humanity in front of us. Um, and yet we have a profound responsibility to do this analytically, systemically. So I'm thinking about holding both. Um, and some of that means having different voices around the table at all times. And some of it means with intentionality going back and forth between the systemic and the analytical and the deeply empathic and compassionate and the human. And, and some of it means living out the analytical with a pr deep, deep empathy and humanity that we've called for um, already um, on, in this conversation. And remembering that even when we need to make hard decisions, we're doing it about the lives of human beings. Um, and that is a, a sacred um, responsibility for which we should have reverence uh, and humility. Yes, that's that's uh, very true, and and that makes me think about the concept of being a mensch. And Victoria, I don't mm. know if you know the term, but being a mensch is like being a being a good person, being a, a person with integrity and empathy and compassion. Now, what is what do you what the three of you think that a Menchie philanthropist does during this crisis? Victoria, do you wanna go first? Sure, I'll jump in. And I, I am familiar with the concept of a Mensch. It's a, it's a good one to pull out right now. And I, you know, we've all said this word, you've all said this word this morning, but humility. I mean, this is the time to put your ego aside. This is the time to join with others. This is the time to listen, right? We need to know what grantees need. We need to know what the community needs. I mean, how do you stop, keep yourself from being up on the hill, making the decisions? You have to be close to the work. And so it's a time where, you know, let's say your funding expertise is in after school programs, and yet you want to help with, with a different area. You want to help with, um, with folks who are suffering from losing their jobs. But workplace isn't your thing. You know, economic mobility is not your area of expertise. Find someone who has that expertise. Join with them. Join behind them. Join in a fund that's close to this space. Their community foundations are creating funds every hour, I think. Those folks know what's happening in their community. And then there are communities of practice. There are, there are smaller communities of issue areas so, so put your ego aside and join with others who, who have the connectedness closest to the work and listen and be responsive. I think 
that humility mm -hmm. is going to be incredibly important right now. Thank you. Jeff, how to, how to stay a mensch in these trying times? You know, it, it starts obviously with, with humility. Um, but I would say it requires a great deal of introspection. Um, let's face it, the people who um, are running foundations are in some ways the least qualified at this moment in time to help because they're not close enough to the action. And, um, and I would urge the kind of, of introspection that's, that, that, that allows you to acknowledge the fact that you are really not the world's greatest expert on, on, on some of this. I would also encourage um, the uh, collective action that we started to see with the statement signed by uh, any number of the Jewish foundations. Um, I'm enormously proud of, of those who organized that as quickly as it did, did it with substance, content, and hopefully every organization that signed that statement will live by those words. This is a moment to walk the walk. It's, it's, it's too easy to talk the talk, sign on to those kinds of statements, and yet continue the, frankly, the arrogance um, that is part of the corporate culture. Mm. Mm. Mark? Um, <clears throat> I'm sure this will come up throughout this conference, but um, I think first of all, we have to remember that um, the professional is personal here the global is local and um, that, you know, we learned from the founder of the Musar movement, Israel Salanter, that, you know, changing the world starts from the inside out. I love that Victoria started, that she was home with her kids. Like we need to remember that it starts with ourselves, our families, our communities, our organizations, and then go out from there. Because I, I do believe menschlichkeit um, in Judaism is not just about what you do, but it's very much about how you do it. And that means that our character is formed by it is the sum total of every single small choice we make. Um, and that could be proactive choices like deciding to wake up and call five grantees and remind them that you have their back. But it also, I think more challengingly is gonna be the, the choices we make in response to hard moments. Um, and I would just kind of throw out there, I think, you know, Menschlichkeit also is the sum total of many different character traits um, that I'm sure all of us uh, wrestle with on a day-to-day -day basis and, and times of crisis. Uh, reveal character, reveal soul, as you said, Andres, but each of us probably has our own soul curriculum to use uh, Alan Marinus's words right now and just staying mindful. I, I think Jeff's point about introspection, this may be a time to start journaling. It may be a time to start what I would call a spiritual chabruta, a, a relationship with someone where you could just talk about what you're wrestling with and kind of slow down to go fast in terms of the choices that we're making um, in our day-to-day -day lives, let alone our larger policy decisions. Um, but the last thing I just want to call out is that um, one particular Jewish value of, of dan lechaf schut, of giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, I think it's much easier to be empathic and compassionate and kind um, when things are going fine. And uh, I think that the moments when other people um, trip us up or get in our way or, or under deliver or frustrate us or do things we just can't understand why they're doing that are going to really test our menschlich kite, and those are going to be moments where we have to dig deep, I think, to trust that everyone's doing their best here. Yeah, I think I can't agree more. I, in the community, we're going to see a lot of stepping on each other's toes, and we need to cut each other some slack and assume that everybody wants to do the right thing. And just then, by the way, apropos journaling, uh, my son is journaling. He has a plague journal, uh, writes every mm. night, and I, I uh, recommend it for everybody and their families. And it, uh, all this conversation actually reminds me of the title of your book, Jeff, uh, When the Heart Meets the Business Plan, or We the Soul Meet the Business Plan. So we need a business plan and we need the soul at the same time and we need to remain uh, empathetic and compassionate. Now, what do you guys think is the penicillin moment of this crisis? Meaning, you know, World War II accelerated, you know, the development of penicillin, it would have taken 20 years, it took 18 months to develop and, and, and bring it to market. Do you see any changes now? Like, you know, it would have taken decades to get all the universities in the country to try distance learning. 
And now we have an amazing pilot project of every university in, in the world actually doing distance learning. So do you, you know, I know we are in the thicket of it and we're just dealing with very concrete problems, but do you see any of these transformations in the future? In other words, what is our penicillin moment? Hmm. Who wants to take that one? Um, yes, I'm thinking. I have the I have the medium term. I don't have the big picture ones yet. And I loved hearing that you guys are developing scenarios. Our team is going to do some brainstorming next week. We need a little space to get there. there. There's something about digital, like back to the digital and the human, like as isolated as we all are, we are having these new kinds of digital experiences and connections, whether it's through learning or working or talking or coordinating culturally, crazy things. 100,000 people at a dance party the other night. I mean, you know, so there's all kinds of, uh, it, it definitely acceleration of the digital. Um, I think that's a huge piece. And for our sector, there's a collaboration piece that, you know, we've all talked about it for a bazillion years. There've been little pieces of it. I think that's going to leapfrog um, and just break through all of the kinds mm -hmm. of barriers that we've had for that before. So I feel like there's a collaboration piece and a digital piece. Those are on the positive side, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's probably some others that, that may happen as well, but I'll stick with that. Any other ideas from you guys? <laughs> I, I think we're going to see, um, as part of this digital moment, a democratization of a lot of the work that we do. Um, several examples in the first week. Um, last week, uh, a group of Israeli Birthright Excel alum um, decided they, as a cohort, wanted to do something. And literally 900 of them signed up to bring pharmaceuticals and groceries to people who would, would have a hard time shopping. Self-organized, the staff did nothing. By Tuesday of last week, they decided what they're doing should be beyond Israel. And they created a global hackathon, Thursday, an all-night hackathon Thursday night to get other alumni to think about what they could be doing in this crisis. And that's an amazing kind of process. It's, it's bottom up. We don't all yet know how to respond to it, but I think that may become a penicillin component um, of this crisis. Mark? Um, yeah, the two things that come to mind, one I think relates to, to Victoria's point is, you know, we could see to some degree the remaking of the, the Jewish ecosystem. Um, which involves collaborations and consolidations and um, a breaking down of silos that, um, you know, can survive for some period of time when things are fine, but can't um, in the face of this kind of adversity. But to me, what's more exciting than that is the potential for a new conversation about what kind of vision and priorities should drive that remaking. Um, and it's really hard for the Jewish community to agree on almost anything, but this feels like a what matters most moment for us. Um, and if there's a way for us to begin a collective conversation about the Jewish future and kind of a, a what matters most conversation that we won't all agree on, but really could uh, galvanize a kind of collective vision of the Jewish future that will help both inform hard choices now, but also kind of shape our priorities for the future. I think that would, uh, that would potentially um, really kind of shape the, the next decades and generations of the Jewish community to come. We have, we heard from Victoria what the Gates Foundation and others are doing uh, in uh, Israel, for example, our friends from the uh, Edmund de Rothschild Foundation, they, they are uh, putting out a, a, a very generous grant, I think it's 14 million shekel to, to help in the uh, emergency. Uh, how do you see the interaction between big funders and small funders in this crisis? Mm -hmm. Very briefly, please. Mm -hmm. And it's Victoria, I'll jump in. I mean, I think, again, the smaller funders are often closer to the ground, you know, and, and the first and foremost, look to your own grantees, see what they need, see if you can build on, if you have extra money to give at this time, look at your current partners. I love that we go as fast as the speed of trust. Um, you can move quickly with those partners. So 
That's the first thing. And then we need to find ways for small funders to be able to surface up bigger needs for larger funders, to bring in co-funding, to identify opportunities. And then again, there are lots of collaborative vehicles um, springing up. So in places where a smaller funder wants to get involved, where they don't have the expertise or the connection, instead of spending the time trying to figure that out right now, look to the, the regional, local, national, the different issue-based funds I mean, consider using that as an outlet. Right. Uh, I would add yeah. um, that we should look toward exactly at what Victoria and her department does. Um, the Gates Foundation has been a model for a very long time in developing partnerships, building those partnerships, finding ways of, of large and small um, I, I recall when, when um, Warren Buffett made the first big gift, I was being interviewed by a number of different reporters and uh, did a little homework and discovered that 1,139 people besides Buffett gave money to Gates within that month. And that's something that we're not good at uh, as a foundation community. Yeah, sorry, just made a mistake here that I, that I want to correct. I mentioned that Rothschild gave 15 million shekels, it's 50 million dollars, it's 50 million shekels, sorry. Yes, Mark, last word. Uh, my last thought is just that I think um, we need to figure out ways to uh, accelerate and almost pilot micro collective impact efforts um, and kind of like run things both this way and up and down um, the, the kind of systemic chain much more quickly. It's one thing to pilot an initiative or a program it's, and, and usually collective impact takes a long time over a long period of time. But if we could find ways to build those muscles and accelerate kind of dynamic collaborations, testing, learning, and then sharing those knowledge across networks, um, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll accelerate change, but also uh, strengthen the entire system. Okay, thank you all very, very much. And thank you for your insight and for your input. And for all of you to listen in, I'm sure that these are going to be trying times, but hearing you and hearing there's a whole chat going on at the side, uh, the comments of the people, I think that this as a community, as a Jewish people, as a humanity, this can be our finest hour. So thank you all very much and thank stay you. tuned for the next event. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well and safe.